Hey, good day, it's Press Allen. Thanks for stopping by. Now, I'm here in the woodwork shop today, and that's because I'm doing a woodwork project. And if you watch my videos for any length of time, you'll know that most of them are centered around model engineering, metal machining, and metalwork in general. But I do love woodworking as well. And the project today is a pair of bedside lamps to go on a bedside table which is integrated into a queen size bed head that I made just recently. Now I featured this on Instagram. I'll give you some shots of what I published on Instagram, but I'll also show you some video of what it looks like in the room now that it's finished. Now you may have heard of an aesthetic style called mid-century modern. Now this is typically uh, evident in homes and homewares and furnishing from around about 1945, post Second World War, up to about 1960. Now given my age, I was born in 1958, nearly every house in our street was furnished in this style. So it's something that's quite nostalgic for me and I wanted to recreate something in that style. So that's what this is all about. Now you can see in front of you I've got some wood, I've got some lamp parts, I've got some drawings. So I'll have a close look at that project in a minute. But first of all, I want to show you around the workshop and the reason for that is that I spent the last half a day cleaning it. <laughs> now I've never done a workshop tour because most of the time this place, it looks like a bomb site. And I tend to just shift stuff from one place to another to get the camera in and around the work that I'm doing. But I got it all cleaned up, so I'll have a quick look at the facilities that I have here and then we'll take a look at the project. Well, we're just coming through the connecting door from my garage and uh, metal workshop. And the space that I have here is around about three and a half meters by six meters, or about uh, 12 feet by 18 feet. And starting in this back corner here, I've got my workbench. There's also a roller door, which I can open up to access a concrete area outside, which is where I tend to do most of my uh, spray painting, wood finishing, etc. And over in this corner is my laser cutter engraver. And that's, uh, a vain attempt to keep the dust out of it. Uh, like a, the woodwork shop is probably the worst place in the world to keep a laser cutter engraver because they are optical instruments. They've got mirrors and lenses in them and you really don't want wood dust in there. But that's about the best I can do is keep that covered up. Now I've got a small Makita drop saw there uh, with all my wood off cuts and then moving over to the circular saw it's on a mobile base that I can wheel around the workshop and that red lever there allows you to lift it up so it can be rolled and when you want to anchor it to the floor you just push the lever back and it drops the frame down onto the floor. So we've got the usual woodworking clamps, all my tapes. This uh, bandsaw here was one that I used in the school workshop where I used to teach for many many years and the school decided to get rid of it. They upgraded, or they said they'd upgraded to a Chinese saw. But this is a genuine wood fast saw, made in Australia. Very, very good quality. Uh, it's a very reliable, and uh, you know, I, I found it to be an excellent saw. And you can tell it's come from the school because there's the Edquip number on it there, <laughs> and the barcode. It says Noosa District State High School. But uh, it became mine and uh, I ended up having to fit a three-phase motor and a VFD to run this in my workshop because it is a three-phase machine. Uh, on this uh, wall here I've got my sandblasting cabinet. That's the only place where I can find to fit it in the workshop. Got a, a little sink here just for washing parts and cleaning up and so on. This corner here, I've got a buffing machine. Uh, I've got a number of buffing mops for that and some scotch Bright wheels. Shop back, I've got a little tiny Makita thicknesser. And over on this wall here, I've got my wood lathe. Now this is an Australian made Heiko lathe. I bought this second hand. Uh, it's not the most heavy duty machine in the world, but for the amount of wood turning that I do, it's absolutely fine. And up on the wall here I've got, you know, just the usual stuff. Oh, and up the top here is all my wood finishing uh, materials. And over here I've got all of the stuff that I use for doing metal plating and uh, parkerizing and that sort of thing. This is a little trick that I saw uh, Stefan Gotchwinter, he talked about a while ago. And I keep all my electrical stuff in there. So I've got screwdrivers, wire strippers, crimpers, 
all that sort of stuff and it's in a, just a tool pouch that I can pick up and carry to the job. That's a great idea. And this is the workbench. Oh, and I've got a little tiny disc sander on the end of the wood lathe there. So the workbench, I've had this now for about uh, 10 years. The original one got eaten by termites. <laughs> I didn't realize, but I had termites in the workshop and they were just slowly consuming the workbench, which was made of Oregon pine. I couldn't understand why the vise was getting loose. One day I went underneath to tighten it and realized that just about the whole top of the bench was eaten out with uh, white ants. So this is a replacement. And uh, just for reference, it's never like that. It's never clean on top. There's always stuff on it. But like I said, I've cleaned up just for you. These are the drawings for the lamp. I've done these on Autodesk Inventor. The style of lamp that I'm making here, I'm just calling a rocket lamp. Now, I don't know if there is a correct name for it, but it's very typical of that uh, mid-century modern atomic age type aesthetic. And given the time period that this came from, which was sort of post Second World War, it was the beginning of the space race. Uh, there was all sorts of exciting things happening in technology. And uh, this was the sort of uh, modern design or modern aesthetic language that was being used back at that time. And it's, you know, in terms of construction, it's fairly straightforward. There's a bit of wood turning, going to do some shaping on the bandsaw. This leg here will be split in two, and it will have a channel cut up the center of it for the wire, which will go up to the lamp holder. And uh, my reasoning for doing that is that I don't want that wire dangling down the center of the lamp here. Now the lamp shades have already been made. My wife made those and I'll show you a little montage of the process she went through to make those. And they're probably the most important part of this design. Anyway, I'm going to show you the wood that we're going to be working with today and uh, need to get on with it. So this is the material I'm working with today. This is called Tasmanian Blackwood. It's a native Australian hardwood. It's uh, got a beautiful colour, uh, but a colour varies. It can go from almost black to almost white in the sapwood. But the pieces that I got from the vendor, he was, uh, well, he was very kind. He colour matched it for me, even though he said he wouldn't do that. And uh, this thicker material here is going to be cut into a square. That will become the central column of the lamp, and there's just enough there to do it. I've got a bit more of this stock here. This will become the legs but it will need to be sawn into manageable pieces and then I need to run this through the thicknesser, get it down to 16 millimeters thick. So we'll go ahead now and get this cut up and uh, we'll get on with the wood working. Here's our stock cut up. These square pieces will become the central column of the lamp. These are actually longer than I need them, so I can turn a parallel section on one end. That will allow me to grip that in a collet chuck or a three-jaw chuck so I can do the finishing work on the pointy end at the bottom of the spindle. But also I'll be able to do the profiling work and cut the pockets for the legs and drill the dowel holes while I've got that section attached. This material here is for the legs. I can get two legs out of each one of those pieces and I have previously laser cut this template from a piece of very thin plastic and this will allow me to get two legs out of each piece. So I'll get one there and then we can flip that around and get another one that way. So four of these legs will be full thickness, uh, 16 millimeters thick and one of these pieces of stock will need to get re-sawn. So we're going to split it down the middle on the bandsaw. That will give me two halves at eight millimeters thick. And then I can cut the pocket for the wire and glue it back together again. So I've got essentially the, the same color and pattern on both sides of the stock, but it will have that pocket in the center. So um, I think we're going to go ahead. We'll do all the wood turning first. And uh, just so you know, <laughs> I'm not an expert wood turner. So uh, it's not my hobby. I don't do it all the time. I can you know, turn a reasonable uh, shaped bowl and a spindle, but yeah, professional wood turners, look away now. 
That process there was just to seat the spur centre in the end of the stock. So you can see the teeth on the drive centre there and tapping that into the end of the wood there gives you a really good positive drive in the lathe. So I'll do the other one and then we'll go get set up in the lathe. That's the, the basic form done now. Uh, this parallel section on the end here will come off later on. That's so I can hold this later on in a chuck. And I've still got some big flats on here. There's one there and one there. But what I'll do now is I'll get some uh, points set on there with calipers. And that will give me some fixed dimensions to work to. And then uh, I might get the other one up to this stage and then we'll refine the both together. Uh, that's the second one roughed out. Uh, they're looking similar. So I need to work on this end here and get this narrowed down, but I can't take it to a point just yet while it's still between centers. Alright, that's far from finished, but uh, I think I'm going to leave it there for now. Uh, this skew chisel is the best way of finishing a surface like that, but they're ultra scary to use. <laughs> if you get the top edge of the skew caught, it will tip in and damage your work and ruin it. So I'm just having to be very careful there. So I've got these two now very close being the correct form, but there's a lot more work in finishing. This piece of stock here is going to give me the two legs that will have the channel running up the center for the wire. So to make it a bit easier to do the resawing process, I'm going to slice this now into two sort of wedge shaped pieces and that will give me two profiles like that. And just the uh, reduced width there makes it easier to do the resawing. I'm going to slice this on the circular saw first, just to give me a sort of a, a cut to follow, and then we'll split this down the middle.
You can see from that grain pattern there that that's a matched pair and that will get glued back together again later after I've cut the groove for the wire. And that thickness, that combined thickness, is just slightly more than the solid leg. And after this is bonded, I'll plane it back to the correct thickness uh, to match the other legs. So I guess the next step now, it's got to go and get this set up on the CNC mill and cut that groove for the wire and then it can go back together again. This is the setup that I'm using to cut this uh, wire channel in the leg of the lamp. So the origin point is right at the very bottom of the leg in the center of the bottom edge and will exit through the center of the section which is doweled into the spindle. Now I'm using a single flute wood router bit, 5mm diameter and we're running that at 2000 RPM. It's not ideal but it does work and I'm only doing a 4mm depth of cut in two 2mm two passes. So I'll get this set up just do one of these on camera but uh, after all four are done we'll flip them together, glue them and that will give us two complete legs with the wire groove. Uh, it worked pretty good. Uh, I think the idea is to use a very sharp cutter and keep your feed rates realistic. That was about 350 millimeters a minute and uh, finish on the inside there doesn't really matter because we're not going to see it. So I'll do the others off camera and then we'll get these glued together. So there's the wire in place now. What I've done is I just extended that groove through to the outside edge of the stock and that way when I glue it together it'll be easy to see how to line these parts up. So it's going to work like that. I can feed the wire through after the leg has been glued together and uh, we'll get that done and we'll do all the profiling on that part. Uh, yeah, worked out good. That's the one that I glued together yesterday. I'll go and get this sawn out to the correct profile and then I'll plane it down to thickness and then we'll route the edges. You can see here I've got a pair of these legs done. I need four all together and these are fairly straightforward. These were just marked out from the template and then it was over to the bandsaw being very careful to leave some waste outside the line when you're cutting on that saw. Then it was over to the disc sander and I was able to clean up the tighter radii and then from there it was into the bench vise and it was just a case of using a rasp and a spoke shave for most of the clean up to get a, a good smooth finish on the edge. So the next step is to get the router and just put a radius on these sharp edges and I'll get the, the leg with the wire groove cut out and we'll do them at the same time. Okay, that's about right. Uh, what I need to do now is put a 3 16th radius on all four edges of that stock. And I haven't actually cut these to length yet. So the reason for doing that is that when you start the router, if the leg was exactly cut to length and the router was to run accidentally around the corner, you'd ruin the end of the leg there. So I'll do all the radius uh, edges, then I'll cut it to length. Mm-hmm. 
can sort of see the line there, that's where I need to cut and uh, this runoff area is just a bit of a safety margin. Sometimes the router bit ball bearing will run around that corner and it may ruin that edge if that's important, but that just gives you a bit of a buffer. Okay, I got that wire through there really easily and uh, you really have to look closely to see the joint line and the two halves of that leg there. So happy with the way that's turned out, but what we need to do now is figure out how to join each of the legs onto that central column. So it's next door to the CNC milling machine for that job. Alright, so what I've got here is a small dividing head with a tailstock and I'm supporting the material. I'm gripping it with that spigot on this end here, that will get removed later. And what we're going to do now is use the touch probe to work out where the center of the tool path will be. So I'm going to offset 18 millimeters from this shoulder and we're going to find the center of the stock in Y. And then the tool path will cut a pocket for the leg and it will drill two 6 millimeter dowel holes at the bottom of the pocket. Okay, I'm going to set my origin now. It'll actually be at the top of the pocket, and then we'll go ahead and cut that. Okay, I can direct index around uh, two more positions, 120 degrees apart, and we'll cut the other two pockets. Okay, now the, I won't show the other one, but the, the last one will have a third hole right in the centre where the wire will come through from the leg and then come up through the top of the spindle later. I've got these dowel holes drilled in the legs now and I did that in the CNC mill, just holding the leg in a vise and I used the same NC code that I used to do this pocketing operation here but I just deleted the pocket and that ensured that the whole centres would be the same and I had a position stop on this end of the leg here so I could do all six and they'd all come out exactly the same. So that's worked out really well. Everything sort of lines up there and I've had the legs actually inserted into the pockets but I'll have to shorten the dowels and I'll do that later. Now, next step is we've got to take care of this end here and get that shape correct. It's going to come to sort of a blunt point and we've got to cut off this spigot and drill a hole down the centre here for the wire. So I've got a sort of a fixture set up in the metal lathe for doing that, so we're going to get that done now. Alright, the last thing to do on this piece here, which I'm now calling a carrot, because that's the shape that it is, I need to machine this end here, get it flat, and I need to bore a 9.5mm hole 50mm deep to meet up with this hole where the wire will enter from the leg. Now at the other end, I need to finish that to a sort of a blunt-ish point and I'll put a pencil mark there where I need to get rid of the excess stock. So holding this is a bit of a mission because there are no cylindrical surfaces. It's got a continuous curve down the full length of that part. So what I've made here is a sort of a, a wooden sleeve and I bored that out to be almost the same diameter as the, the biggest part of that carrot shape. 
and I can just sort of push that in and drive it through friction to machine this face here and then I'll drill and bore and when I turn it around we can do a similar thing on the other end it's not quite as uh, stable because of the extra length sticking out but we'll see how we go and I've got the bed of the lathe covered up with a bit of cloth here and a few magnets Right, that end is done, so we should be able to just flip this around. Alright, now, this end is going to be a lot more of a challenge because it won't run through. So I'm going to bring it on centre just by putting the tailstock support in there, but I've got to remove the tailstock support to finish that off, so we'll see how we go. Okay, so I've got the tailstock pushing that stock into this wooden chuck here, but um, I'm going to machine down most of this stock where the centre is. Um, I don't know, <laughs> I'm going to wing it. Alright, now I've got to cut this shorter. I think I'm just going to do that with a saw and then got to figure out a way of actually shaping that without putting any side loading on it. Um, let me think. Right, uh, that is the correct length now um, and I think I know what I'm going to do the old Dremel with the drum sander trick. Okay, now the good thing about this is that it doesn't actually require any you know, cutting force, it's just sort of grinding away at the material. So I'm just going to roll it over and try and get sort of a bluntish point on that while it's rotating. Alright, uh, that actually worked. So I'll get the other one of these done and then we can assemble the legs. Couldn't really think of a way of clamping these legs onto that central carrot. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to rely on the dowels to hold this. So we're using 6mm dowels. These are actually too long. I'll just sand these off short. I mean, if I was making a chair, I wouldn't rely on this method, but given that this lamp is very, very light, and it's not going to get moved very much, it's going to be fine. All right, just getting rid of that little burr on the end there. That's all I'm doing for each one of these. I'll clean that glue off, I'll get the other two legs in, and I'll show you the two lamps sitting on the bench. Well, there they are. Now, I let the glue set overnight, and I was having some doubts about how hard it would be to pull the wire up through the top of the lamp holder here. So I had to go with this one and got it to work. I did have to make a little stainless steel hook just to pull the wire from where it exits the leg and has to bend round, come up through the top of the lamp holder. Now the lamp holder itself will get wired onto there later on. 
and when we did a mock-up with the lampshades on we realized that it actually looked better with this threaded tube extended by 60 millimeters the original design had the lamp holder sitting down right on the top of that wooden spindle there but with that 60 millimeter extension it means that you can see the threaded tube and it looks a bit untidy so i'm going to make a decorative cover to go over that and that's going to be in the next video now Unfortunately, I've run out of time for today's video, so when you come back and watch the next one, we'll do all of the varnishing process on the wood. I'll make that decorative cover. That's going to be a bit of metal working, uh, so I'll do some metal turning, some fabrication, and some electroplating. And uh, I want to show you how the lampshades were made, because that was a fairly lengthy process, and I think it's worth seeing how it was done. So that's all coming up in the next video. Now I'm going to finish up today with some wildlife clips. Now some of these are just taken around our garden, but the first two that you will see came from the lady that I work with at Wilbo's. Now when I send off the donation, she often sends me a thank you and sends some little clips of some birds and animals that they're caring for. So we'll see those two first and uh, then we'll just have a look around the garden and see what's, what's there. Alrighty. Uh, Thanks for watching today. I'll see you on the next video. It's Prezzo signing out. Cheers. This is a rainbow lorikeet chick, uh, probably raised from an incubated egg. They have to be weighed just to ensure they're actually putting on weight as they develop. This little guy is a rufous betong, sometimes called a rat kangaroo. Uh, they are a true marsupial. Uh, they're not a mouse or a rodent. And this little guy is just uh, enjoying his freedom in the garden and eating some clover. spotted these galahs next door. Uh, they're not common species around here. I did tend to find them out in the western districts of Queensland where it's drier. And they generally feed on seeds and grain. They're a pretty bird though.